Hi, I'm Madison Orisi, and I'm going to be digging in deeper into the mystery that is Ancient Nubia. I recently attended the St. Louis Art Museum Ancient Nubia exhibit so I could gain some facts and knowledge about a place that I never knew existed, which by the way I would recommend seeing. It will be based at the museum until August 22nd. First off, I love Ancient Egypt. I first learned about Egypt in 6th grade and for whatever reason I became really, really fascinated with it. So the fact that Nubia is basically Egypt's cousin, I knew that I would have no problem being engaged and interested in learning about it. And thanks to Professor Stalter and Professor Whalen, over the past two years, my love for Egypt has grown even more. So without further ado, let's get into the unknown wonders of ancient Nubia. Nubia was located on the northeastern side of the continent of Africa, separated into two regions, Upper Nubia and Lower Nubia by the Nile River. As you can see, not too far away from Lower Nubia is Egypt, and not too far away from Upper Nubia is Sudan. Now, if you're like me, you probably think the upper and lower regions of Nubia are backwards. Trust me, they're not. They just want to be complicated. Based on historical evidence and artifacts, Nubia is dated all the way back to 2000 BC. And to give you a more art historian form of wording, it would be in between prehistoric and Neolithic time periods. So, if you want a better visual of the time period, they, the Nubia was dated all the way back to when the Venus of Willendorf was made or created um, when it was found in Austria. For the Nubian empires, the Kush kingdom, or empire for that matter, would rule over ancient Nubia for over a thousand years. Over those many years, the Kush empire would bring about three separate sub-kingdoms, that's what I would like to call it, that would rule over Nubia for an additional 3,000 years. First would be the Kerma. They ruled over most of the Nile Valley and, became, and came close to having just as high ruling power as Egypt did. They were very articulate in the way they built their temples using mud brick structures for their dead. So instead of pyramids at the time, they would just build these brick structures out of mud. Next was the Napata, who became in close contact with the Egyptians. There were even marriages among the Egyptians and Kushites. The intermixing of the Egyptians and Kushites led to the use of pharaohs wearing certain headdresses, which showed that they were of both royalties. More dotingly, one that includes a cobra called a nereus, and you see these headdresses in many Egyptian and Nubian paintings. Um, it's basically just a headdress that depicts an upright cobra. Um, a snake is very common in Egyptian culture because um, it is a symbol for strength and power. Lastly, we have the Moreau. During their time, they dealt with a lot of trading with other countries and Egypt. They are also very known for the construction of their pyramids. One of their necropolis has more pyramids than all of Egypt's. They are different from Egyptian pyramids, however, because their tombs are underneath the period, whereas the Egyptian tombs are just inside the, the pyramid. Pretty cool. And a necropolis is basically just a big cemetery with um, lots of tombs and usually is found in ancient cities. So the first two pieces of artwork that I have shown to show you is the Nubian tribute presented to the king Tomb of Hawaii, created and painted by Charles K. Wilkinson in 1923 and 1927. Now the reason I say that is because I want, believe that this is a recreation or a restoration of this painting because it was originally from 1353 BC and 1327 BC. Um, so I couldn't find too much information, but I want to say he either found this piece, restored it, or repainted it. And the second one is this mask of Queen Malachi made with gilt silver, silver during the Nepation period. Um, she ruled alongside her husband, King Tantamani. Um, I found this mask to be really beautiful, and I don't think I ever heard a gilt sever before, but it does kind of look like bronze or like some type of casting. 
Next we have the temples, and just like the Egyptians, Nubians built big, beautiful temples and pyramids to give praise to their pharaohs and gods. Lower Nubia was home to the Temple of Dhaka, built during the Roman period. This temple was dedicated to Thoth, an ancient god who more than likely is depicted as a bird with a scribe, as he is a messenger. And you may have seen him on the Book of the Dead um, scribe, um, which is my favorite Egyptian piece ever. So that's where you might have seen him before. Um, another temple that I found to be quite magnificent was the temple Wadi al-Suba. It was originally built for the god Horus, who is also depicted as a bird. Um, yeah. And um, it was actually destroyed and rebuilt, and then was rebuilt for Ramses, King Ramses II. Um, this temple caught my attention because of the giant sphinx statue depicting Ramses II himself at the end of the courtyard. So just imagine having to build that, because that is pretty crazy. So here we have some Nubian symbols slash hieroglyphics. Um, if you look at these symbols, you may recognize them or think you've seen them somewhere. Well, it's probably because they're also Egyptian symbols. There could probably be countless arguments back and forth who did the hieroglyphics first, but I mean, they already share so many other different things. Why not their writings? Um, these three that I have wrote down on here are the three favorite ones. Um, they're probably the most common. Um, the Eye of Horus, which is a um, symbol of protection, so he oversees everything. Um, I found this tattoo, which, you know, I kind of want to get one. Um, next we have the Ankh, which is right here, and it is a symbol of life. So it, it looks like a cross, but with a hook at the end. In many Egyptian and Nubian paintings, you'll see them holding them all the time. And I actually found a necklace with the Ankh and a Eye of Horus on it, so that would be pretty cool to have. And then next we have the Scarab Beetle, which is um, essentially given to the dead when they are buried as a gift of good luck in the afterlife. And commonly under the Scarab Beetle um, is hieroglyphics and sometimes is depicted with wings and the sun at the top above it. Next we have the Black Pharaohs, which were the Nubian kings that ruled over Nubia's short-lived con contentment and were given the name Black Pharaohs. There is much controversy over these Black Pharaohs because their name was given to them in a discriminating way, to some extent. It is noted that archaeologists have set aside Black Pharaohs because they did not believe that Africans could have such a high rank of royalty. Is often called is often the talk of reasons why Egypt is dominant over Nubia, because a lot of people do not want to believe that there were pharaohs of darker skin, and in exquisite reality, Egyptians were not white skinned. They were not light skinned. They're basically they were very dark skinned, um, but the way they depict themselves um, give themselves lighter skin over the Nubians, which. Altogether, they probably both had very, very similar skin tones. So, despite what people may believe, the Black Pharaohs contributed so much to Egyptian and Nubian culture, so they should never be taken out of the picture. Um, if you're like me and you love Egypt and all the aspects of it, you probably never even knew that there were Black Pharaohs. So, um, if you would like to pause and read... The picture in the middle, I got that from the St. Louis Art Museum. It just tells a little bit more about the whole Black Pharaoh thing um, that I don't have a lot of time to get into at the moment. Here are the five Black Pharaohs, um, the main pharaohs who ruled over Nubia. We have Pharaoh Pai, Pharaoh Shabaka, Pharaoh Shabiku, Pharaoh Takara, and Pharaoh T Tantamani, which is the king to the queen Malachi mask, so that would be her husband. There are many surrounding cultures that were influenced by the Egyptians and Nubians, including the Greeks and Romans. As you see in this piece over here, 
this face is a more natural and realistic look and if it didn't have the Egyptian headdress it would probably definitely just be seen as Roman um, and you know all the Roman statues had this exact stature and look to them they're you know more realistic looks um, you know, just like a Roman statue, but he's wearing an Egyptian headdress or a uraeus with the snake at the top. And not to mention that Julius Caesar had a relationship with Cleopatra, which is very known. Um, so she probably brought in a lot of Egyptian culture stuff and it got intermixed with the Romans and they thought it was a good idea. Um... The Egyptians were also found to have influenced much of the Roman architecture, as you can see with this Roman temple. Um, this is an Egyptian one. Very, very similar. May not be as small as the Egyptian one, but very influenced with the columns and everything. They're also influenced with their different painting styles, with this one in the middle being a first painting style. Um, there's first, second, and third, but this one is the first one. And it looks very similar to this Egyptian painting because it looks, you know, it's painted on the wall. Um, but, it, you know, it has that distressed, distressed look, worn out look, and it just looks very similar. As for the Greeks, they would often visit Egypt and were very much in favor of Egyptian statues and forms. So this one is the Greek Koros statue um, with the closed fist, very stiff stature, and the left leg in front of the right leg, which is the contrapposto stance that everybody should know about. Um, and this one is the Egyptian um, King Menkari and his wife statue. Um, very, like, you could like copy and paste. It's literally copy and paste with this one. Same stance, same stature, his hands are enclosed like twins, almost. And they also were very fond of Egyptian scarabs and small amulets, which they too created their own. So this one is the Greek one, and this one is the Egyptian one. So this one has hieroglyphics on the bottom. This one seems to just be like an underside of the, the beetle, but obviously very very similar compared to other african cultures nubia is just different where the nubians have headdresses made from gold and other materials compared to the other cultures like cuba for example they have masks made from local materials like cowrie shells feathers hair anything anything they have and they cover their entire head only Nubian royalty are allowed to wear allotted headdresses, but even citizens in their but even citizens in other African cultures are allowed to wear headdresses or masks, especially when participating in the mask ceremonies or dances rituals. You do not really see or hear about ritual dances or chanting coming from Nubia or Egypt for that matter, but I do find it interesting how various places can be different even if they are from the same continent but it is no different from the united states either so for nubians it's just you know the culture around them is just so similar to egyptian that it compares nothing to the other african cultures here's some artwork that i found um this one is a marotic jar depicting the cobras again these are canopic jars, um, very Egyptianly influenced. Um, canopic jars held in the organs that were taken out from the deceased, and they would go in there with their tombs for the afterlife. And these are necklaces made from resources, and these are cowrie shells and the eye of Horus in the middle. So he's watching you always. This is some artwork that I took at the St. Louis Art Museum. Here is some granite statues with the contrapposto stance. Um, this one's twisting his head. <laughs> this one has some hieroglyphics on the side. 
This is a steely, um, which is a slate, pretty much with hieroglyphics, paint, drawings, whatever you have, inscribes um, on it. And I unfortunately did not take a picture of the information card. So I don't know who this guy is, but very Egyptian. And then these are little amulets. Um, if you are able to see it, I don't really know. This is like a little Egyptian um, storyline picture. This, I want to say, is Horus, but I don't really know. But whoever it is, is holding an Ankh right there. Very important. And I, these are probably little scarabs or little amulets that they've carried around with them throughout Nubia and Egypt. And these are some memes, um, you know, something fun and entertaining, but if you want to stop the video and read them, I hope you guys understand and get a laugh out of these like I did, because they're educational, so why not? And last for my final slide, we have the winged Isis pectoral, which is the head of the Nubian exhibit at the St. Louis Art Museum. It is their advertisement picture. And when I tell you how disappointed I was that this was the actual size, I was very disappointed. Because this makes it seem like it's a huge gold, you know, amulet ornament. And it's not. It's not big at all. It's probably a lot smaller than this picture shows right here. Um, but it is from the Nopatian period of Nubia. And it is Isis with her wings and an ankh and they say this is like a sailboat um but I, I don't think anybody's really sure what else she's holding so i hope you all learned something um from this video about nubia that you might not have known and thank you for watching <laughs>